again, it's great to have you with us. We're here to worship our Lord and Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, together. And so let's begin that by going to read Psalm 3, which says this. O Lord, how many are my foes! Many are rising against me, many are saying of my soul, there is no salvation for him in God. But you, O Lord, are a shield about me, my glory and the lifter of my head. I cry aloud to the Lord, and he answered me from his holy hill. I lay down and slept. I woke again, for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid. Of many thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God. May you strike all my enemies on the cheek, you break the teeth of the wicked. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing be on. Heavenly Father, we come before you on this glorious day, a day that we can call glorious irrespective of the weather or our mood or the difficulties that we've had this week, the difficulties we might have had even getting here this morning, Lord, but we can call it a glorious day because this is the day that you have made. This is the day where we rest and worship you. Father, we thank you for Jesus. Mm. We thank you for your spirit and we ask that you would help us as we seek to worship you in spirit and truth this morning. Lord, help us to pray, help us to actively listen to what you would have say to us, your people. And Lord, for those who don't know you who will be sat in churches all around the world today. We pray that you would save in great power. Mm -hmm. Lord, we pray for your people who are unwell today, who would love to be in church with their brothers and sisters in Christ. Lord, we pray that you would bring comfort, that you would teach them, and lift them and encourage them, Lord. We pray for this week ahead, that you would equip us today, you would remind us of things that we will need this week mm -hmm. to fight the spiritual battle that we're in, and to live as representatives of your Son. Mm -hmm. Father, we pray this all in his name and for his glory. Amen. Amen. A couple of announcements to, to whiz through. Uh, firstly, congratulations to, to David and Ruthie, hopefully coming to the 11 o'clock service, so they've named their little baby girl Elizabeth, so uh, Elizabeth Merriam, beautiful little thing, and uh, she was born as we were praying for her to be born on Sunday night on our Zoom meeting, which was quite lovely, and uh, so yeah, please remember David and Ruthie and little Elizabeth in your prayers. Um, we had our Open Doors prayer meeting on Wednesday night, if you would like the DVD, on Wednesday, either because you missed it or you were linking on the Zoom and the connection wasn't great, uh, please help yourself to it. There's only one copy, but first come, first serve on the table at the back. And there's also this month's copy of the Barnabas magazine. Please help yourself to that. They sent you two copies of one day this month. Um, next week, Gordon Dingle will be preaching here in the morning at both services, so please pray for Gordon from here on wide. And uh, John is preaching today at Snail Beach. No idea where that is. <laughs> Shatford, is it? Shropshire. Shropshire. Right, okay. Not too far. I'm not sure if you ever go as much travelling as you had the other week. So, uh, so please remember John this morning. And um, tonight we're going to be taking communion. Okay, so if you're linking in on Zoom, please have your wine or juice or whatever you want to have and your bread ready. And uh, we'll take communion together tonight. That's it in the way of announcements, unless anyone's got anything else. Okay, let's, uh, let's sing. So, um, Paris was just singing it now as we're coming in. It's only a 
holy God. We have had it, we think, once before, don't we? But, uh, a little while ago. So uh, we're just going to go for it. We'll all just sing together. So everyone, let's stand and sing. Only a holy God.
like this to be hard for you. I pray, Lord. Father, we thank you for the beautiful words in that hymn. You are indeed a holy, holy, holy God. More than that, you are our holy God. Even more than that, you are my holy God. Because of the precious blood and sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Father, thank you for saving us. Thank you for making us into a situation where we can call the holy God our Father, who art in heaven. Father, thank you for Jesus and his sacrifice. Thank you for the Father and his holiness. Thank you for the Spirit who intercedes for us. Father, help us to understand and appreciate him more and more as we grow in our faith. In Christ's name, amen. Thank you. sometimes, Lord, because we know our deepest thoughts. And even when we do a good job of correcting our outward sin, we know what lurks deep beneath. <coughs> Being holy is not something that we feel. But Lord, thank you that because of Jesus, it is something that we are made to Holy Spirit, we pray that you would continue to apply the life, the death, and resurrection of Jesus to our lives. Mm. That you would continue to transform us into his likeness. So that your holiness permeates throughout our whole being. Keep changing us, we pray. For we pray this all for your glory's sake. word for us now as we continue our journey in John's Gospel. We're at John chapter 16 and we can look at verses 1 to 15 together. So yeah, John 16, 1 to 15. I have said all these things to you to keep you from falling away. They will put you out of the synagogues. Indeed, the hour is coming when whoever kills you will think he is offering service to God. And they will do these things because they have not known the Father, nor me. But when I have said these things to you, that 
when their hour comes, you may remember that I told them to you. I did not say these things to you from the beginning, because I was with you. But now I am going to him who sent me, and none of you ask me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer. Concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of Truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own authority. But whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. The beginning of chapter 16 begins with a warning and then a mild rebuke to the disciples about their inward thinking. And then it moves on to the work and the promise of the Holy Spirit. And this all directs the disciples in their mission. And it directs us in our mission. So those are the, the three things that we're going to quickly look at this morning. Firstly, the warning. Secondly, the work of the Spirit. And then finally, the mission. So first, the warning. You've probably heard it said many times before that Forewarned is forearmed. I think sometimes when things go wrong in our life and we don't expect them to come, they're the times that it really rocks us, it hits us for six. We weren't even thinking about that. But we don't feel ready for that. We don't feel equipped to tackle it and deal with it. We had no idea it was coming. Jesus knows what's coming. And he wants the disciples to know what's coming. He wants them to be prepared. He wants them to get their armor on, ready for the battle. You, you might have heard the, the five P's for preparation prevents poor performance. I used to say that a lot to my, to my salesmen and women because they, they might turn up late for an appointment. They might be half dressed when they get there because they didn't get up early enough. They didn't allow enough time for traffic. It was all poor preparation. So when they get to what they should be doing, they're not ready. Throw them off guard. Jesus wants the disciples to be ready. So that when that first hate fueled attack comes, he's already told them the Lord hates you. Because you hated me first, and now you're representing me. So will hate you. And when that first attack comes, you've got to be ready. He doesn't want them thinking, oh, we've been caught in ambush, or what's going on here? This, ah, Jesus never mentioned anything about this. This hatred, this, these ambushes, all this, this attacking, he's honest. It's the devil who works in the opposite way, that doesn't reveal things, that he presents us with the base the stuff that looks attractive, when we get lured in, we get sucked into that situation, but behind the bait and the hook, that's how he works. He works with lies and deceit and deception. Jesus doesn't work like that. He is truth. So he tells them the truth. He doesn't tell them everything at the same time, because as he says later on, he can't cope with it all yet. He tells them what they need to know, when they need to know it. And now is the time for them to know about this hatred that's coming in their way. And he wants them to be ready. He's not sugarcoating it at all. And it's better that they freak out when he's with them. He's there to comfort them, to help them. And even if they freak out,
freak out and they're full of fear, which they will be again when he leaves, they will have the comfort and the help of the Holy Spirit. They're not going to be alone. But this is the first mention of them being hated and persecuted. Or the first mention that we read about in the Bible anyway. Because up until now, the focus of Jesus has been on showing the disciples that he is Messiah, he's Son of God. He is God. He's fully divine, but he's also fully man. And he's done his miracles, and we've read all about them in John's Gospel. These signs to show who he is. Yes, to the world, but also to his disciples. Because he's preparing them, he's teaching them all through this journey. But now is the first mention that actually you're going to be hated. You're going to be persecuted. This would be shocking to the disciples. Because up until this point, it was Jesus who perceived all the hatred. Not them. They watched it. They've been confused by it. But it's different when it's happening to someone else, isn't it? You can feel that, that compassion and, and try and relate as best you can, but as long as it ain't happening to me, <laughs> that's the main thing. And Jesus says, no, actually, it is going to happen to you. You're going to receive a taste of what I've been receiving. And they may have had these thoughts of what on earth did we sign up for? Don't we feel that sometimes ourselves in our Christian life? What have I signed up for? What am I doing? Why am I bothering? We want to put down the cross that we've taken up. We're fed up with the struggle. Things have just got a bit too much. We just want to bail. But this mention of they in verse 2, Jesus is referring to the first religious terrorists, persecutors, the Jews and the Romans. And this threat that Jesus mentioned, they will kick you out of the synagogue. Now we might kind of gloss over that a little bit because we're like, synagogues, who cares? That's where Jews go, not interested. So we might then relate it to, okay, that might be like being kicked out of church. So you're a member of a church and then goes to a church meeting, you have that shame and embarrassment that because you've been so caught up in sin and you've refused to repent, that you have to leave the church. Some of you may have been part of churches and you've seen that happen and may, may have happened to you. And it's terrible, it's painful. But it's not as bad as being kicked out of synagogue. Mm -hmm. Being kicked out of synagogue meant that you lost all connection with your community. Not just the church. Mm -hmm. Everywhere. You couldn't marry within that community, you couldn't do business in that community. So you may well lose your livelihood. This was pretty horrific. I think the closest we've had to hearing a taste of this in modern day life was when Muriel shared her testimony a few weeks ago. Mm. Muriel was part of a very strict brethren fellowship and she was cut off felt so isolated, ignored in the street. Somebody who she prayed with, read the Bible with, and they walked on the other side of the road as she was coming along. Horrendous. This is the kind of thing that Jesus is warning the disciples. You won't be able to worship in community, do business, marry. They would have held a funeral for you in this culture. You were dead to the community. God, they would have mourned you because there was no way back. It's not like nowadays if you do have to leave a church for church discipline, the hope of the pastors, the, the congregation, is that there is repentance because we want you back. They didn't want them back. They were dead. We got, we got a taste of it back in John 12. Verse 42, where it says that many believed in Jesus, but, but they didn't do anything about it. They didn't publicly confess their faith or follow him because they were scared of the religious leaders. They were scared of being kicked out of synagogue. They knew what it would mean for their families and business. 
And then the Romans, we, we know about the Romans, the way that they treated Christians up until 313 AD. The Romans absolutely hated Christians. They crucified Christians in the masses, lined up the roads for miles and miles with crucified Christians. Any threat against Caesar and Roman authority was punished severely. Very little tolerance for Christians. And all this is very different from a prosperity gospel, isn't it? <laughs> very different. Any creature that tells you that following Jesus is a way to riches and success and earthly glory is a salesperson. Mm. And they're selling you short. Because Jesus offers so much more than temporary riches and comfort and health. What he offers is a turn. Mm. And he says to the disciples, you are going to be hated for a little while. You are going to suffer for a little while. Paul calls it those brief and momentary troubles. It's just a tiny little while. But here's the tension. Heaven loves you. The world hates you. And you need to live in that tension for a little while. Verse 2 also mentions this, the frightening reality that we, we know. That these people who will be persecuting you and, and hating you and even trying to kill you will think that they're doing a service to God. They will genuinely believe that God is pleased with what they're doing. And what they don't realise is that they don't know God at all. And they're not known by God. Their God is Satan. Satan is the leader of all false religion. He leads the rebellion of hatred. And we know from Wednesday night that persecution comes in many different forms. It's not always very outward and obvious. With violence and guns and knives. Persecution can work in many different ways. But Jesus is explaining that tension. The world brings pain, Jesus brings joy. The world tells lies, Jesus is truth. The world offers rebellion, Jesus offers a route to the Father and eternal glory. It's going to be worth it, says Jesus, but there is a cost. Benefits will outweigh the cost. The, the prize is worth the price that you will pay. But there's a cost. Peter knew that. 1 Peter 4 verse 12 says, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice. Inasmuch as you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed. For the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. What's the greatest danger to us Christians when we're facing persecution? Injury? Embarrassment? Pain? Death? Jesus says no. The biggest danger is falling away. Verse 1. I have said all these things to you to keep you from falling away. Matthew 11 verse 6. Blessed is the one who does not fall away on account of me. This is the warning. It's a warning filled with love, isn't it? But it's a warning. Be prepared. Be ready for what's coming. That's the first point. The second point, the work of the Holy Spirit. Have a look at verse 2 again. There's a mention of the hour. They will put you out of the synagogues. Indeed, the hour is coming 
when whoever kills you will think he's offering service to God. Mm-hmm. All the way through John's Gospel, we feared this would be hour. So when they tried to arrest Jesus, stone him, throw him off a cliff, kill him, Jesus said, my hour's not yet come. He's fully in control. He's working on God's time frame, on God's schedule, and the world can do what they want. They can organise, they can get masses of people behind them. The devil can recruit huge numbers. Organise and plan for everything in place. Jesus says, my hour's not yet come. It's not happening yet. It'll happen when I decide. I will walk to the cross when I'm ready, when God says it's time. But my hour's not yet come. Now, Jesus is talking about these haters, the world's hour, the hour of persecution, the hour of trial, the hour of testing, which may well be coming for us one day. When will we face our hour? But no matter how hard it gets for the church, in the way of persecution and suffering, the hour for us won't be like the hour for Jesus. His hour, when he died, when he rose, when he won, that was the worst that it's ever going to be. But for those who stay hating him, hating his church, their hour will come as well. An hour of judgment, when they will have to pay their own debt to God. And that's why verse 8, if you just jump down to verse 8 for a moment. And when he comes, he's talking about the Holy Spirit, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. That's part of the work of the Holy Spirit, but it's also a work that the church does as well. And the Holy Spirit does that through the church. That we are to speak about sin. And righteousness and judgment. These are three things that we, we don't hear a lot in, in some churches. I spoke to somebody a little while ago, and they were a little bit discouraged and struggling. And it was ironic because the thing that they were struggling with is, he said, I haven't heard sin mentioned in church or judgment for a couple of years now. And you say, why does a Christian want to hear sin? in church. But he has a genuine concern. Because he knows that it doesn't matter how many unbelievers are coming into the church, if they don't realise that they're sinners who need to repent and turn to the living God for righteousness, they're going to be judged. And either the judgment happened at the cross, or it's going to happen when Jesus returns. On that incredible but faithful day. Sin is a denial of truth. It's, it expresses itself in unbelief. Rejection of Jesus. So you can't correct individual sins until you deal with the fundamental sin of unbelief first. That has to happen first. All individual sins are symptoms of that disease. And righteousness, Psalm 143 says, no one is righteous before God. No one. But when Jesus walked the earth, the world got to see righteousness incarnate, righteousness in the flesh. You got to see it face to face. Someone who's completely right with God, right before God. And when he left, People still needed to hear about righteousness. And that's why the church needs to speak about righteousness. The Holy Spirit will prompt us to speak about righteousness. The Holy Spirit testifies about righteousness through the Bible, through the church. The righteousness that's needed for heaven. The New Testament speaks about it in Romans 3. No one's righteous. Not one. Righteousness is found in the Holy One, Jesus. That's why the church is referred to as being righteous. We're not righteous in and of ourselves, are we? But we're clothed with the righteousness of Christ. Mm -hmm. 
judgment. The world must know that God is just, that judgment is coming. Where do we want to be judged? At the cross or before a holy God? Standing on our own with our own righteousness. Mm -hmm. Won't be good. So the Holy Spirit empowers the church in this, this mission of conviction. And the goal is repentance and faith. That's the goal. Always the goal. And the reason that the unbelieving world is guilty is because they say, Jesus is a sinner. I'm righteous. Whereas the Christian says, no, no, I'm not righteous. I'm a sinner. But Jesus is the righteous one. And he clothes me in his righteousness. Mm -hmm. I'm hidden in him. I'm hiding behind his holiness, his righteousness. My sin has been dealt with at the cross. I've been judged already. Judgment's done for the Christian. Sin has been paid for. The disciples need to know this, the, the world needs to know this, because eternity hinges upon this. That's why we must speak about it in church. We must speak about it outside of church. How we do that is another topic of discussion for another day. We must speak. But these disciples, they're, they're struggling, they're going to lose their teacher, their rabbi. He's going. And he's told them, you don't need to worry. You're going to have an inward teacher soon. Not somebody who's beside you, getting alongside you, but somebody who's going to be inside you, the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit will teach you, will remind you of these things that I've been telling you about all these years. And often when um, we're being taught something, we don't always feel that we need to hear it. We don't always feel like this is helpful. We might think, well, what's that going to do with anything? A bit like when you were sat in school in a maths lesson and you had that question, Tommy has a room that's three by two meters and Tommy's got X amount of wood. He hasn't got enough wood to lay the floor in his room. How much more wood does Tommy need? And we all sat there saying, I couldn't care less how much wood Tommy needs. I don't live with Tommy, so I couldn't care less. Let Tommy worry about it. I'm speaking to his mum and dad. But then we get a bit older and we have our own homes or our own children or grandchildren and they need to work out how much laminate flooring they need for the bedroom. And all those things that we were taught those years ago, they come back and oh yeah, I don't have to work out the square footage of a room. How many planks I'm going to need. Brilliant, pretty helpful. I didn't think about it at the time. Lots of uh, training courses for work are a bit like that, aren't they? You sat on the training course thinking, this is useless. When am I ever going to need this? And sometimes it's years later. You think, oh yeah. Mm -hmm. I remember that now. Mm -hmm. First aid course was a great one. <laughs> How many times have you remembered something from a first aid course? Donkeys years ago. Mm -hmm. well, more importantly, Jesus says, the Holy Spirit will remind you of things. Will remind you of scripture when you need it. We'll remind you of a, a line from a sermon that you never thought you were that into at the time. God is doing his teaching, he's doing his preparation work. When I was called to full-time ministry, I, I looked back on my working life and I thought, I looked back on my whole life and I thought, I haven't grown up in church. I, I've not had that Christian input. I've not been told anything about the Bible or God, what kind of preparation is this? Being a, a footballer, being an apprentice footballer, sweeping changing rooms, cleaning football boots and toilets, how's that helped? Being a sales manager and, and training salesmen, and then the more I look back, the more I thought, oh, how many times have I sat with a family who was struggling with something? How many times did one of my salespeople approach me and struggle with, with the, the stress and strain of commission only and the worry of, of being a family person and paying a mortgage and all the practical difficulties. And it hit me for six because I thought, wow, 
has been preparing me my whole life. My whole life. All those times when he's been teaching me, and I wasn't even listening. I didn't think I was taking it in. But the Holy Spirit reminds us of those things, those important lessons that we need to learn. And we learn them when we need to learn them as well. But he doesn't teach us all at once. And if we cast our mind back to the vine and the branches, that sap, that trans that kind of delivers all the nutrients, all the goodness to the very tip of the branch. But it doesn't all happen instantly at once, does it? It gradually moves its way through. At a different time, at the right stage. You might think of um, the high priest who was anointed in the Old Testament. They would pour oil on his head. It's a symbol of the Holy Spirit being anointed and empowered by God. And as that oil would drip down the beard of Aaron, down his body, that power, that teaching, is spreading through the body of the church, the body of the high priest. And it will get to every part of the body eventually, but it will get to the right part at the right time, in God's time. Verse 12, Jesus tells the disciples, you can't handle everything right now. You're not ready. I know you want to run before you can walk. He says, a little while. I'm sorry, he says, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. You cannot bear them now, not yet. There's more that you need to learn, more that you need to know, but you're not ready for it. I'll tell you when you're ready. We want to know everything, don't we? Mm-hmm. What's going to happen tomorrow? What's going to happen at my work? Who are my children are going to marry? When I'm going to die? I want to know all the details. And God says, I've told you everything that you need to know. <laughs> when you need to know it. Just trust me. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, you'll be overwhelmed. You'll be like Martha trying to do loads of different things, and then you get your priorities wrong, and you get overwhelmed. You get anxious and stressed out. He says, just trust me. In my time, you will know. I often think that when we don't know something, like some people say ignorance is bliss, don't they? Not knowing. There are some things that we need to know, we need to be prepared, we need to not be caught off guard. There are other things I think, actually, do I really want to know that? Do I want to know the day that I'm going to die? Do I want to know all the, the details of how I'm going to suffer for the sake of Jesus? I'm not sure I do. Because if it comes to the crunch, and I'm in a situation like what we prayed about on Wednesday night. Our brothers and sisters around the world were suffering severely. If we were told today that that's what we're going to face tomorrow, we might run away, mightn't we? We might run in the opposite direction. We might not get on that plane. We might not be called to that work that God is calling us to. He's telling the disciples that there's hatred coming, there's pain coming, there's suffering coming. But I'm going to be with you every step of the way. I'm going to tell you what you need to know, step by step. I think we have to be especially wise when we're speaking to new believers and bear this in mind, not to overwhelm them with everything all at once. Mm-hmm. Peter asked Jesus some questions about where he was going, and then chapter 
14, Thomas asked some questions as well. And on the face of it, those appeared like quite godly questions. But Jesus reveals actually there was a, an agenda with those questions. They were asking those questions, Peter and Thomas. Really what they're thinking about is how does this impact me? They didn't care about how Jesus was feeling, where Jesus was going. What was the turmoil going on inside of him? They were just caring about themselves. Well, what does this mean for me then? Are you going? What am I going to do? And so there's that, that selfishness that's inside the disciples. And we've all got that friend and that family member who very rarely asks you any questions. They, they're too busy talking about themselves. And any time they ask you a question as if it's something related to them, how it's going to benefit them. And they're just shrouded in that self-centeredness. Their whole world revolves around them. And what impression does that give? Well, it gives you the impression that I don't care about you. I don't love you. I don't care about you. All I'm thinking about is number one. And that type of Christian will tend to read their Bible in a very individualistic way. What does this mean for me? What does this verse mean for me? How is this going to help me? Rather than looking at it to the church, the global church, the local church. Seeing the big picture. What does this mean for us? More often than not, I think that's how God wants us to read our Bible. Thinking about the local church. Thinking about the big church family. Not just me. And Jesus, yes, he's rebuking them, but we know that he's full of compassion. We know that it's for their good that he's correcting them. Because I think what he's saying to them is, I need you to look above and beyond these circumstances and these fears. Because what happens tomorrow is bigger than your fear and your grief. Jesus will go to the cross tomorrow. And Jesus calls us to invest in something bigger than our short-term troubles. He calls us to invest in an eternal kingdom. And our mission, if we choose to accept it, is to share the fruit of the gospel. We've been talking about that quite a lot in recent weeks. It's fruit that the Holy Spirit produces in our lives. We're to share the fruit of our gospel in our lives, but we're also to, to share the message of the gospel with our lips. Mm. It's both. We've talked a lot about this on Zoom on Sunday evenings. It's about what we say and it's about what we do. How we live and how we talk. And what we say when we talk. And how we say it when we talk. Essentially, we continue the mission of Jesus by spreading the message of Jesus. And it's a daunting task. It's a bigger mission than we can cope with, even working together. And that's why we need the help of heaven. We need the Holy Spirit to empower that work, to guide us, and to unite us together. And Jesus has led by example all the way. He's, he's shown that he spearheads the mission of the church because he's the head of the church. He's the head of the body. He's not detached from his people. He's in it with us. So when we suffer, he suffers. And while he was with the disciples, and this is why this moment is quite shocking for them, because while he was with them, those three years of being their rabbi, he took all the hatred. So when they wanted to throw someone off a cliff, they didn't talk about throwing Peter off the cliff, did they? Jesus. He took it all. So those disciples were there with him and he stood at the front leading the mission, directing all the hatred upon himself. When they wanted to stone someone to death, it was him. When they wanted to kill someone, it was him. What a beautiful gospel picture. He, the representative of the church, the head, will spearhead the whole mission. He took the pain. He bore the loss as he said. He stood in the place of his people. He took the punishment that they deserved, that we deserved. He took it all. Since the very first day my new 
spiritual bill. I've had this repeated thought and dreamt about it many times of queuing up to see God. To see and stand before a holy God. And I've had this fear that as I, I'm in the queue waiting to see him, that I'm thinking about all the sin that I've done in my life. And it's overwhelming. And, and there's this mountain and, and weighing me down that I get. And I'm just about to get to the front of the queue. And then Jesus comes. And puts a robe around me. And a ring on my finger. And shoes on my feet. And I'm absolutely stunned in this robe. Clean. Mm-hmm. Righteous. Holy. Beautiful moment then, all the fear is gone. Being a slave, being a sinner is done. It's paid for. That's what's coming for the Christian. Jesus is saying to his disciples, I'm leaving now. People are going to hate you, but you still need to love them. You need to tell them about my love for you. The horror and the glory of the cross and the resurrection is going to further teach the disciples. Transform them into a bunch of cowards who are so overwhelmed with fear, into a bunch of people who are healed, who will transform the world and will die for the message that they bring to the nations. Each and every one of us. The cross is our, our focal point, isn't it? It's our motivation. And our mission is their mission. We share a lot of their fears and occasionally their self-centeredness. What does this mean to me? But Jesus has died. And the Holy Spirit will lift our heads up and beyond our own circumstances. And we will be reminded of the great mission upon our lives that we will try to live for Jesus. We will try and represent Jesus. And if necessary, we may die for you. Lord Jesus, we give you our thanks this morning that you are the leader.
massive price that you paid for us to return to you, for us to be able to even speak to you now. Lord, may we be willing to pay a small cost, a small cost to follow you. And that's this in your precious name.